Hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on Destinations International 2019 Destination Next Future Study. My name is Kate Skidmore and I'm the Senior Director of Membership Engagement at Destinations International. I am so excited to be joined by the MMGY Next Factor team today who I'll introduce and send uh, control over in just a second, but just a few words of housekeeping. We are recording this webinar and we will also um, have the chat and question box open. So we'd love to hear from you. If you have your audio pin, we'll be able to unmute you at the end or can simply um, just ask questions to the team and we'll be sending the follow-up as well. So with that, I will kick it off to our MMGY Next Factor team. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Well, hello everyone. Um, it's Paul. We met here. Uh, sorry about my cold, but it's uh, my pleasure to welcome everybody to this webinar on Destination Next. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with our program, there are two parts to Destination Next. The first one is uh, a future study. This is uh, a detailed review of key trends and strategies in our industry. We, we did the first one in 2014. We updated the study in 2017 and uh, in St. Louis we just released the new future study for 2019. This program uh, is one that was also developed uh, in 2015 and it's a, a scenario model which was uh, designed to help assess uh, destinations. And uh, during the last uh, five years, we have now completed over 200 detailed assessments of destinations uh, in uh, about 12 countries. So uh, we're going to deal with both of these today. I'm going to turn it over to Greg Oates now to touch on and give a briefing on the future study. Thank you, Paul. And hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us. We're going to give Paul's voice a bit of a break here. I'll be talking about um, the future study and all of the, what went into the development for um, this year. So really, we begin every future study by putting together four advisory panels um, across different segments. And we talk with industry disruptors such as Google, Airbnb, TripAdvisor, and all the different technology providers to see what's happening in their space. And we speak with industry clients. These are event planners, um, people that put together special events uh, to understand how that sector is evolving. We also speak with community leaders. So these are people that are outside tourism, um, government, uh, community, and cultural civic organizations, as well as philo philanthropic uh, associations. And then we also speak with destination leaders. And these are people that have just sort of our colleagues. We, uh, For example, I spoke with Peter Yesowich, one of the founders of MMGY Global, to understand um, what he's seen and what a lot of our other colleagues like John Lambeth from Savatas, who put together tourism industry um, bids. And we then pulled all of that different insight together and started to think about, okay, what are the major trends um, that are evolving in the global visitor economy? And what do we need to really focus on um, in order to, de to define strategies that destination organizations can use to capitalize on those trends? But before we did that, we looked at, we created a strategic radar map of six different categories to kind of use as a filter to um, process all the different trends and insight that we had put together. Um, we, we pulled some trends from 2017, but then we also um, introduce some new trends uh, to look at through this strategic radar map as well. And altogether, we identified 52 trends, um, and then we didn't stop there. We also looked at those 62 strategies that destination organizations should be aware of. So that put that was sort of the basis then for how we moved forward uh, to develop destination next. What's really important is that there's a huge variety of destinations and uh, participants in this year's survey. So very much a global scope. We had 521 participants uh, respond to the survey from 55 different countries. What's more, a very diverse range of organizations in terms of the budget size, 
market segment in terms of their mandates, um, if they're addressing both uh, meetings and leisure uh, segments or just one of, and then also business and governments, governance models. And as you see here, the vast majority were nonprofit organizations with or without uh, memberships. So now let's just look at the top 20 trends um, and sort of see where the biggest movers were for 2019. What's interesting here is that three of the top 20 trends were new this year. And I think that these are something that worldwide we're all um, looking at. So for example, in the green here, the numbers represent um, where they showed up in the top 20 trends. Number 14, more communities and municipal governments are aware of the importance of tourism to the local economy. So very much this idea that tourism is recognized more as an economic driver in more destinations. Uh, number 16, people are seeking more personal enrichments in their travel and this idea of the democratization of, of wellness and well-being, moving into transformational travel, these kind of uh, themes where people are using travel to support their personal and professional goals and aspirations. And this other one, destinations looking at sustainability, came in 17, the first time now where we're talking about sustainability much more broadly, and really encompassing economic, social, and environmental impacts instead of just focusing on that um, ecological side. So those are some of the big shifts uh, for 2019, and we'll talk more about those as we move forward. So then we looked at these trends, and we wanted to try and understand which ones could DMOs influence and can which ones um, not necessarily so. So we create a future map. Now a future map is different than a SWOT analysis, which many of you are familiar with. You still have your access to uh, calculate threats and opportunities, but at the same time, we're now looking at those that are controllable and those ones that uh, destination organizations can control. So then we put these on the future map, all the different trends, and really there's four quadrants here that we have to focus on. What is an opportunity and controllable? Those are trends that need to be exploited. And then what are controllable but are a threat and how can destinations uh, mitigate those? Meanwhile, there's also uncontrollable opportunities that need to be monitored and then uncontrollable threats that require some kind of contingency plan, whether that's for weather or downturn in the economy, security threats, uh, those types of things. But really the focus here, whenever we talk about strategic planning and destination master plan, is to focus on those um, controllable opportunities that are available. So what was interesting, when we put all the different trends onto the future map, by far the vast majority fell in the, the controllable opportunity quadrant, which destination organizations can leverage and capitalize on them. And just look at all these different juicy trends you have here across the board, whether that's technology or community development, regional collaboration, developing more authentic travel experiences, customizing content, um, those types of things. So a lot here for destinations to play with um, moving forward. Really the crux of Destinations International's Destination Next platform are the three transformational opportunities that come out of it every time we put this together and we complete this worldwide survey. So this is really what a lot of the research and a lot of the strategic planning and destination master plans that we do hinge on uh, in terms of where the global visitor economy is going moving forward. The first transformational opportunity, and again, these are all based on the trends and then how we bucketed the trends um, in the radar map and put them on the future map. So here, the first one is destination stewardship. And it's really this idea how globally there's been a shift from destination marketing to destination management, and now really to destination stewardship and taking a leadership role in the community beyond the hospitality and tourism industry. So really this convergence of tourism, community, and economic development, sustainable tourism, equitable economic economic development, and really thinking about quality of life for the residents, marrying quality of place for visitors and ensuring quality of life and benefits for the destination itself. Major theme worldwide. 
Now, you can come up with all the different types of destination management stewardship strategies you want, but unless you have community alignment, they're not going to get very far. So, again, another major conversation in all sorts of destinations worldwide, but the need to build coalition among governments and residents around a shared vision for the destination and how uh, tourism plays a role um, in that development of the destination. So we talk a lot about um, engaging communities and engaging residents much more intentionally than we have in the past. And the third one is digital conversion. For ever since the iPhone came out in 2007, we've been talking about digital engagement. Now because of emerging technology platforms, there's more of a strategic shift to focusing on digital conversion. So not just so much about likes, but how can travel brands and destinations drive business develop in the destination? A lot of us don't want to book uh, specific experiences two, three weeks out, but when you get to the destination, then all of a sudden we said, okay, well, let's, um, let's do something. How do we find that and how can brands provide the opportunities for uh, consumers to book in the destination on demand? So the, the next part of this presentation is really going to dig into all three of these and provide some, some examples of, of each. First, let's though, look at the top strategies um, also for 2019. So what's interesting here is that the strategies that we put together based on all of the analysis we did completely validate the three transformational opportunities and align with the major trends. For example, uh, number eight, top, the eighth top strategy for 2019 was my destination will have a tourism master plan to define uh, direction. So when we talk about destination management, community alignment, regional collaboration, it's a much more complex industry than it was even five years ago. So now destinations really of all sizes are looking for some kind of master plan to inform the direction moving forward. Uh, number 11, my destination will better integrate tourism, economic development, community development. Again, very much aligned with uh, this evolution of from destination marketing to destination management. Uh, the other two new ones, my destination organization will develop outreach programs in our local community. So the shift towards more community-driven economic development and how the residents within a community can be part of uh, tourism development and growth. And then the last one, my destination organization will leverage our destination's priority industry sectors to generate business. This is mostly on the business event side where destinations are leveraging their local knowledge base, their intellectual capital to engage meeting planners in those specific industries. Okay, so starting with the first transformational opportunity, destination stewardship. Really there's three trends that support why this is an opportunity um, that all destinations should focus on. Number one is the thirst for unique, authentic, personalized experiences. Now this has been obviously a major theme for years, but it just becomes more and more so, and it was the number one trend uh, in the Destination Next 2019 survey. So it's just more authentic, more personalized, and more immersive into um, new regions within a destination. For example, here in Miami, you can take spray painting classes in Wynwood, which is known for its graffiti and art galleries. Those kind of experiences are becoming um, more and more in demand beyond the iconic experiences any destination. And just as a good example of that, let's look at Montreal. Three years ago, they celebrated their 350th year anniversary, and they want to do something special. And so they put together this program called Montreal Illuminations, and it was really a focus on how to use light and storytelling and next generation technology to communicate really the essence of the city. And there was various parts to it. Uh, one was a whole light show in, in the main basilica. Uh, another one involved a lot of different uh, lighting, LED lighting put along all the bridges going across the rivers. And then a third one, which we're going to show a video of here in a second, was projection mapping, where they created stories that really told the history of Montreal, whether going back to the very early days and then through hockey and then um, into their food, to, to give both visitors and locals a sense of place, by all means, and really what it means to be in Montreal. So let's take a quick look at this video of that.
So what's interesting, we show that video in so many different places, and then we'll meet people months later, and they remember that. Oh, I saw that Montreal video. I mean, it's a phenomenal piece of work, both the video and, of course, the experiences they put together in Montreal. But it really speaks to the talent and the innovation and the creativity and the destination, so much so that Watkins Research um, recently ranked Montreal as the number one meetings destination in North America. Also, in 2016, the province of Quebec um, created more job growth than the other nine provinces in Canada combined. So very much um, driving the destination brand. Um, Montreal, one of its creative sectors, one of the sectors is creativity and digital media. So again, this is an example of that convergence of um, the local um, innovation economy and the visitor economy to really tell a different, unique, authentic um, story about the destination. So the second trend that really makes destination management and stewardship important for all of us in the industry to focus on is this rise of integrated sustainability. So focusing on economic, social, and environmental impacts. UNWTO came out with this in 2005, defining sustainability this way. And then in 2017, uh, put out the International Year of Sustainable Tourism for Development. I think 2017 people still thought of sustainability in terms of the ecological impacts, but more and more now uh, consumers, mainstream, the industry are starting to think of sustainability as also equitable economic development and community building. When we talk about the future and try and define the future, there's actually a structure for that. You look at the best of the best, the best organizations and destinations that typically are always at the forefront of trends globally, and then you start seeing commonalities. And by understanding those commonalities, you can start to predict um, where the industry is going. One example of that, is, of course, is Holland Tourism, and they just came out with their 2030 perspective uh, paper at the beginning of this year. And the focus is very much on the fact that, quote, every Dutch citizen will benefit from tourism by 2030. And the idea here, what they're doing is developing train stations like this one here on the right to connect the entire destination, making it easier for people to get visitors to get around the destination and to um, invest in uh, the different neighborhoods uh, throughout the entire country. So very much an example of visitor dispersal, sustainable mobility, um, equitable economic development, um, and such. So we look at this as a best case study, and then we also think of this in terms of smaller destinations and mid-sized cities. And Madison, where the University of Wisconsin is, they have uh, their Bucky mascot. So Destination Madison worked with the university and put out a bid for artists to create different types of sculptures um, in Bucky's image. And altogether, they created about 65 of these, and then they were either put up for sponsorship or sold. Altogether, the destination ended up earning $1.6 million. They gave $1 million to charity, and then about $200,000 to put the program on, which means the destination then uh, earned $400,000 for its own operation. So an excellent example of community building and um, economic development. Third trend is really this convergence of what interests tourists and what interests the business community and the destination and benefits the residents. So really the convergence of tourism community and economic development. This is an example in DC, it's the 11th Street Bridge. It's connecting downtown DC and all of the business and activity and um, assets there um, with the Anacostia neighborhood across the river, which was really the country's first um, suburb. This is much more than just a physical bridge, it's a cultural bridge, it's a community bridge, but it's also a venue for events and a venue for uh, leisure travels to learn more about the city. So this, I think, really epitomizes this idea of destination development that benefits both um, the community and visitors as well. This is also another good example of that on the meeting side, Albuquerque um, has all these federal labs like Los Alamos and Sandia on the outskirts, and they wanted to leverage that um, 
really innovation that's happening in the destination. So they create an innovation district, a collision space for new ideas downtown, where now they can bring meeting planners into sort of a shopping center for, for innovation. And basically Albuquerque now positions themselves as brokers of innovation, much more than brokers of uh, hotel bedrooms and meeting space. Okay, so the second transformational opportunity now is community alignment. And this idea of building coalition among government and residents around a shared idea, a shared vision for the future. Again, three trends. One is this idea of how important resident support um, is for long-term success of a destination's visitors economy. So this whole idea we're seeing around the world where destinations are just being overwhelmed in visitor volumes, tra travel is going up everywhere in the world, but they want to go to the same destinations a lot of times. So these destinations are um, incurring just volumes that they haven't, they're not really prepared to deal with. And we know about the Barcelona's and the Venice's of the world, of course, but now this is becoming much more common in other destinations. We were just doing a strategic plan in New Smyrna Beach, a little town in Florida, and they're saying there's um, residents um, that are now concerned about over, over compression. Same thing in um, a few other cities that we've worked in in the U.S. So how can a destination really approach that? And this is where is leading to this whole idea of working with the community, communicating to the community more about the value of tourism, providing resident uh, sentiment surveys uh, much more aggressively than has been done in the past. I think Hawaii Tourism Authority provides a really good case study for this. If you look at their four new KPIs, you usually always have visitor volume, visitor spend, these types of things that destination organizations use to measure their success. But in Hawaii now, they have visitor satisfaction and resident sentiment. They measure those now to evaluate the success of the organization. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of this. We haven't, this is really sort of out in front because um, Hawaii, their numbers continue to grow. And at the same time, they want to ensure that residents have the same uh, level or quality of life as they're traditionally accustomed to. So they put together this video. What's great about this? upcoming video is that it very much addresses um, the visitor and speaks to the visitor but also speaks to the local community and expresses very clearly um, how the community is fundamental to the, the overall visitor experience. <laughs> Together as a people, as a community, as an industry, we go forward with a mission and a commitment to finish strong. Our task is to guide the course of our leading industry sustainably, compassionately, and strategically. Our focus is balance, and we constantly strive to align Hawaii's cultural values, preservation of our natural resources, and community needs with our visitor industry objectives and economic goals. No one can share the authenticity of the Hawaii experience and connect people to our culture and legacy like those who call these islands home. Our community members stand at the forefront in welcoming our malihini, or visitors, to our Hawaii and perpetuating our values beyond our islands. The Hawaii Tourism Authority is always committed to doing what's best for our culture, our heritage, our way of life, our families, and our communities. Join us in continuing to share our Hawaii with visitors and the rest of the world. So again, very much focused on speaking to the residential community to communicate the value of tourism for the entire island and really to show that the community members make up an important part of the overall visitor experience. Now the second trend here under community alignment is how um, in more destinations tourism funding is being diverted to address social issues or there's talk about um, funding being diverted. We've really seen many governments, local, county, state, you know, even at the national level are putting major pressure on destinations to reallocate money towards crime, education, health, infrastructure, homelessness, and 
things like that. So this combined with the shifting resident support is a pretty big thing we have to think about. One example of how uh, cities are starting to address that, the Washington State Convention Center, in order to expand, is investing almost $40 million in affordable housing over three decades. I spent a lot of time talking with many of the CEOs along the West Coast where homelessness is an increasingly um, bigger and bigger issue, and all of them are now starting to invest more time and resources in working with local organizations that are active in addressing homelessness and other social issues. And the third trend is really how the policy environment is growing more hostile. Everything that happened in North Carolina around the bathroom bill has been well chronicled, of course, and the impact that had on the local visitor economy and how a lot of different events pulled out um, that were scheduled to take place in the state. And then this happened a couple of years ago in Texas and very aware of what happened in North Carolina. Um, all of the different destination organizations came together and rallied uh, civic organizations and the business industry and said, look, we need to um, stop this and we need to make sure that we protect not just the visitor economy, but the, the local business community and all of the different types of facilities that hire so many people. So again, um, a growing issue and what seems to be happening is even when there are successes like in Dallas, next um, back and is back on the docket. So this isn't just an issue in large cities though and states, even in smaller destinations like um, Breckenridge where we worked and a lot of issues with parking, high compression, day traffic was just getting out of control. So this idea of coming together and putting together a vision about the quality of life for residents and quality of place for visitors and establishing that whatever's being done needs to take into consideration the well-being of the local community really went a long way to assuaging the, the concerns of the local um, town council and how they um, decided to move forward with some of their strategic planning. So third transformational opportunity is digital conversion. And again, this idea of shifting from engagement and just looking at how many likes you have to providing the platforms to drive in destination mobile bookings especially. Just for a few examples of what we're talking about here, every minute there are 3.8 million Google searches, 4.5 million YouTube videos are being watched, the number of tweets and how many people log into Facebook. So this is we've been looking at for well over a decade now in terms of just how people are using um, digital devices to consume content. We know this. But now there's more of a focus too on digital conversion. One million dollars spent online every minute. It's just Expedia, $21,000 is spent online um, with that OTA. Uber, Airbnb, Airbnb's up Q1 2019, they're up 31% year over year in terms of spending. So how people are spending online is something that we're looking at a lot more. First of all, you have things like visual search and augmented reality, which are removing the friction between brands and consumers in the destination. Here, you put the phone up um, to a restaurant and the visual search will identify and connect you with that establishment. Then here is Google Lens on the right as well. Well, Google Lens and Google Assistant, where their app is specifically designed to find or search for things, not by typing, but by using the camera or uh, using voice. Likewise, conversational commerce, chat, all powered by artificial intelligence. Um, this idea that really consumers want to engage with brands in destination using other types of technology. Specific here, like at the Rose, Rose chatbot at the Cosmopolitan of Las Vegas, people can interact with that on their phones using Facebook Messenger, and that's driving 30% higher revenue on property. Also, from a destination standpoint, San Francisco Travels working with ChatFuel. They created a new chat that really does a great job, and every destination's interest in this, in getting people to from the iconic experiences right down to the types of experiences that they want. So customizing that engagement. I went from Golden Gate Bridge to 
this specific tour in about 30 seconds. But most importantly is here you have a function to buy. So if I'm in the destination, it makes it really, really easy to buy day of. And what's driving a lot of this is just the advancement in live inventory um, platforms, making it easier for a lot more small destinations or small businesses to get involved in this. But it, the destination has a role of providing a platform like this to help drive um, engagement and conversion. And then here's an example of TripAdvisor, which completely pivoted in 2018. They're now not just a review site, but a social media platform, tour provider, and booking engine. And their AI can, does a great job in understanding what the individual user wants. Here's an example of how destination organizations are getting involved in that and, and posting or providing an opportunity, again, click to buy in destination on demand um, day of. Here's a video that explains a little bit more from TripAdvisor. On my tours, I started doing it for fun. TripAdvisor means a lot to our business. My guests who come to the site, they are looking for authentic experience. Something exciting, something memorable. Since TripAdvisor is the biggest travel site, we had customers from all over the world. I don't think our business would have grown without it. Experiences are everything. It's the way to connect to people. TripAdvisor allowed us to reach an audience that we didn't have access to before. And so this isn't just TripAdvisor experiences, but now there's Booking.com experiences, Expedia experiences, Airbnb experiences, of course. Um, there's, this is still growing. There's, we've talked with some people that are on some of these platforms, and there are some challenges and some cost issues, but it's really important, I think, just to see where everything's going and making it much, much easier for people um, to spend money in the destination day of with um, small uh, travel suppliers. Okay, so just to sort of sum up again, really all of this hinges on those three transformational opportunities, which I think this time around really show the complexity of where this industry is going with definitely new and emerging challenges, but at the same time all kinds of opportunities um, to, to grow a destination and help more and more residents within the destination benefit from the global visitor economy. So again, that was destination stewardship, community alignment, and digital conversion. All right, so that sums up uh, the Destination Next Future Study for 2019. We're now gonna turn this over to Kathleen Frankfurt, who's our VP of Marketing, to talk about the second part of Destination Next, which is the scenario model that we use to provide destination assessments. Thank you, Greg. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. I just want to spend a few minutes talking about the scenario model, which is the second part of Destination Next. And essentially, uh, the scenario model, it's a detailed model that assesses the overall destination strength of a destination, as well as community alignment. And it's based on feedback that you get from your stakeholders, your community leaders, your business leaders, your board and your staff. It's a wonderful way to engage your community and really assess the, the challenges and the opportunities in the destination. And depending on where you fall, you'll be in one of four quadrants. So um, just r r thank you very much. Um, going back to the quadrant scenario, you can see trailblazers have strong community alignment, uh, strong uh, developed destination. Of course, that's where every destination organization wants to be, but the reality is most destination organizations are not. So we work with um, organizations to get you to that trailblazer category. And if you're already in the trailblazer category, we work with you to develop strategies to make sure that you stay in the trailblazer category, you actually grow in that category. And in terms of the variables that comprise each one of the, um, uh, you know, the destination strength, that would include things like 
number of hotel accommodations, uh, what kind of facilities you have, the strength of your brand, air access if it's applicable in your destination, mobility and access. So all of these 10 variables account under destination strength. And then under community alignment, we look at things like funding support, your local community support, partnership strength, the strength of your industry, workforce, et cetera. So as you can see, we've done a lot of these all over the world, um, and we've been really fortunate because we've amassed a, a very large catalog of case studies. So whenever we're working with an organization and we're in a workshop where we're going through your results, we go through the future study as well, we're also able to look at the challenges that you're facing and um, you know, bring in case studies of other destinations that have experienced the same thing so that you can be inspired by how they tackled um, you know, their particular challenges challenges or how they really optimize something um, that is a tremendous benefit to their organization. So you can see the next slide is a map of all of our coverage in the U.S. that continues to grow. And just going back to uh, Greg's point about, uh, you know, the major things that we're finding in our case study, you know, under destination strength, you know, obviously mobility and access continues to be a, a big challenge, especially as public transportation is just so critical. Uh, convention and meeting facilities and air access, uh, big challenges as we face uh, moving forward in the future study. And then our community alignment, workforce development, uh, funding support, local community support. And again, that local community engagement is so critical. And we find that when destination organizations can do that well, um, they just, they, they tend to be much more successful, have great collaboration in their community. So just a quick note before I turn this back over to Kate for questions. We have been working on uh, four new Destination Next programs. Our commitment is to customize uh, as much as possible because we realize that different categories of destinations are different and have different needs. So over the past five years of doing this, we've been getting a lot of feedback from destination leaders and experts who work with uh, large numbers of DMOs to, to get their feedback and to refine these products to better serve various categories. So the first one is for global cities, and that's essentially if you're a top 25 global destination by visitor count, uh, if you have a top 25 international airport, if you're considered a national capital city, or if you're a major international center for business or finance, this would be the type of destination product that would suit your business. Um, second one is luxury destinations. So if you are a destination that is considered a luxury destination or you aspire to be one, this is the category that would suit you. Number three is resort destinations. That's currently in the works and we hope to have more information on that within the next couple of months. And then the last one is for small DMOs. That's for uh, small destinations that are not considered a resort destination and that have a budget of $2 million or under. And the advantage to utilizing one of these programs is that we basically take your competitive information and we can compare it to other destinations in your respective set. So for example, under global cities, you would be compared to all of those other destinations in that particular subset so that you can see how you compare specifically against other global cities. So again, I didn't wanna take a lot of time explaining this because we wanna have time for questions, but more than happy to share detailed information with you. We do have one sheets on each one of these in the event that you would like more information. And Kate, now I'm going to hand it back to you for wrap up. Awesome. Greg, Kathleen, and Paul, thank you so much. Um, I'd invite everyone to go ahead and enter any questions you have. And I do have um, a few to start with. So can you talk a little bit more about how destination organizations are working with economic development organizations and high tech companies really to increase um, business meetings? Yeah, absolutely. This has been a trend that we've been following for a long time. I think it it really kicked off with Lynn Lewis Smith and Business Event Sydney back in 2010, 2011, where she was really one of the first ones to come up with this idea that instead of just use, talking about your attractions and your infrastructure to host meetings, to the expertise you had in specific sectors um, throughout the destination and leverage that to speak to those uh, meeting planners specifically in those sectors to show that if you come to the destination, then you know, we can provide speakers and business development opportunities and research opportunities because we have um, 
experts in a like-minded field. And that just grew, and then Germany and Holland started doing, really focusing on that. Germany by expertise was a major campaign. And so as watching that, we, we were wondering where it would come, you know, big in the, the U.S. And I remember uh, in D.C. was one of the first there, and speaking with Melissa Riley, who's the head of Convention Sales and Services, and she's actually the head of the Convention Sales and Services Committee for Destinations International. And we were at South by Southwest, and DC had a big installation there called WeDC, and she said, you know, everyone has a convention center and, and restaurants and new hotels. We need to differentiate ourselves. And she talked about how the destination is number one for women CEOs in tech. And number one in African Americans in, in tech. And they talked about the VC capital they had available and all this whole burgeoning innovation economy around tech and medical actually, and they've expanded that now to other sectors. And so that's how we're gonna differentiate ourselves uh, in the global meetings marketplace. And since then, in the last really two years, I've had the same kind of conversations with Seattle with their event innovation forum. And we showed Albuquerque and San Antonio and Phoenix, and the list just goes on and on and on where destinations now are much more active in creating content and sales materials and relationships with their local innovation economy to leverage that more effectively to drive meetings to their destination. Thanks, Greg. Uh, Mary Ann from Boulder uh, sent us a comment, a question really. Boulder is interested in expanding the, um, I believe it's audience, from the 2016 group to include more integrated partners as well as residents. How can they proceed by doing that? Could you say that again? Yeah, let me see if I can unmute Marianne. Or Marianne, if you can, let's see if we can get you. Can you hear us, Marianne? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, thank you so much for joining us today. Do you mind rephrasing your question for us? Well, we had a, a small group, in my mind small, probably um, under 50 people that participated in our uh, Destination Next survey. And since 2016, when we did this, we, we've, we've garnered more strategic partners. Uh, we've also developed a, a, a resident sentiment survey. And we just wanted to include more people just to, to broaden it, the group, just to, to understand, you know, truly, are we a trailblazer or, you know, knock back a couple uh, pegs? So how would we do that? Right, so a variety of ways. The fact that you have a resident sentiment survey, I think, is the foundation for doing that and to make sure that it's um, done on a regular basis, either twice a year or once a year. So then you can start establishing benchmarks about how the destination is evolving, how resident sentiment is evolving. But just by starting that, I think, is key. And then, of course, doing the destination next assessment. Now it comes to the point of how are you sharing that information with the community and how are you potentially bringing some of the um, creative ambassadors or people that are doing interesting things in your destination to some of the events you provide and giving them a platform to talk about what they're doing in their neighborhoods to um, both um, elevate the visitor experience and look at um, the Greg, I think we're cutting out a little bit. Kathleen, do I still have you? Yes, Kate, I'm still on the line. Oh, okay, well, we wait for Greg to um, come back. We have another question. Um, what do people do with the results of the DNEXT assessment? Can you um, touch on that a little bit for us? Sure. Actually, I went through this when I was president of Discover Lancaster last year, and a lot of people uh, go right into a strategic plan with these results because it's great. You've got the future study information. We layer that with your specific results from your destination, and it's a wonderful way um, really to see the low-hanging fruit. What, what changes can you make relatively soon and have a meaningful impact in your destination? So probably about 60 to 65 percent of the destination organizations I work with go right into a strategic planning session and they crank out their next strategic plan. Uh, for some destinations, it's the impetus for a master plan. They'll see things in there that, um, you know, really open their eyes in terms of needs in the community. 
things that they realize they cannot do by themselves as a destination and they need to collaborate more with economic development and other community leaders. Other destinations have created local engagement, community engagement campaigns um, and destination strategies, so many different applications. Perfect. Thanks for touching on that, Kathleen. Um, how about, I'm not sure, if, Greg, do we have you back with us yet? Yes. Sorry about that. Oh, okay, perfect. Can you touch, I think one of your slides um, mentioned something that I think a lot of us can relate to. Is there anything that CVBs can really do about the rising homelessness in their cities? Right, and it's, there's a lot of conversation about this, and it's not just in some of those larger cities where it is an issue and the, we know it's an issue, but um, in smaller destinations as well, more and more. Um, we've just been at a, a couple of college towns where it was raised. I think, and I'm just going to pull out, use some names here, and I think they would be okay with that. With Tom Norwalk, CEO um, in Seattle, Jeff Miller, CEO in Portland, and Joe D'Alessandro, um, the CEO in San Francisco. And speaking with all of them about this, they've developed a really, really wide um, network of people and organizations, non-profit organizations that are um, doing things to address homelessness in the destinations. And they're providing their networks and their communication platforms uh, nationally and globally um, to assist these organizations and also investing resources. And I know Tom Norwalk said when he brings meeting planners and they don't try and hide that anymore. He said that they're actually you know, showing where there's issues, but more importantly, they're showing what they're doing and how they're active in their community and um, trying to be part of the solution. And we saw the one example from the convention center. Um, also, when we were in Breckenridge, um, the town council there is providing, I think it's $17 million a year in subsidized housing, which is more than Denver provides, um, because they specifically see that as an issue that's impacting the visitor economy, and it's just something that they feels important for overall quality of life. So the first step is really just understanding all of the different nonprofit organizations and various actors that are doing something like that and building those networks and offering whatever services the destination organization can um, to support these uh, nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you, Greg. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can unmute another participant. We have Chad from Ann Arbor. Chad, are you able to speak into the mic? No? Oh, hi, Chad. I think we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. yes hi. How should uh, CVBs address criticism from residents and local elected officials that uh, their efforts to promote travel and tourism to the destination lead or cause gentrification? Yeah, so that's a big one. First of all, having that conversation, being open to it, of course, it's really, first of all, to communicate that the destination organization is aware of this and has a plan to address this. And part of that plan generally involves visible dispersal strategies, bringing, and I know this very well because we work with Ann Arbor, um, getting visitors to explore more of the destination. You have Ypsilanti there, which is about a 15, 20 minute drive from central Ann Arbor. Um, how do you get traffic out to there? What is Ypsilanti doing? Um, and they're doing some cool things to get uh, visitors to move out of the core and explore that. And then also, how are they supporting um, the government to develop new transportation options to get workers from Ypsilanti into Ann Arbor? So um, the, the value of the the benefit of the tourism economy and all that money is getting dispersed more evenly throughout really the entire county, not just in all the different townships. So communicating what that strategy is and that um, the, the DO is very much aware and focused on uh, avoiding those issues of overcrowding and gentrification. And at the same time, when you start throwing a word, that word around gentrification, you're getting into a lot of other issues about just economic development in general. But I think in terms of the way you're talking about it here, that you don't want to push out existing communities because the destination is growing economically. 
really that the destination organization is then flipping that around saying, okay, how can we get visitors spent into some of these emerging destinations? And very, again, just like before, the question before, being very vocal and communicating that really well to the community. Does that answer that? Thank you. So I have another question. I think this really ties all these different pieces together. And we know we have a lot of seasoned, um, seasoned CVB folks on the call, but for someone that's newer in this whole process, can you touch a little bit on what is a tourism master plan and how does that work? Where would you start to create one? Wow, yes, um, a great question. So as we saw with the three transformational opportunities, again, just the complex industry and the global visitor coming today is much, much more um, higher and intense than it was even five years ago. So really tourism master planning, started maybe around the the recession uh, a decade ago as destinations weren't wanted to understand how they could um, be more f effective and successful really what this involves is establishing is working with a destination and bringing a team there to work with first the destination organization and a steering committee to understand um, just sort of the situation in that uh, specific destination and uh, what are the some of the challenges and what are, are some of the opportunities and understanding where the destination organization is at that moment and then working with them to come up with a vision and a, a mission but at the same time then doing a lot of various types of community engagement sessions which includes one-on-one -on -one with with key stakeholders and we do focus groups with different types of uh, segments it might be the hospitality segment then it might be retail young entrepreneurs academia uh, definitely government public works and having all these conversations in different types of forums to understand again what are the challenges and what are the opportunities and then bringing everyone together around town halls and visioning workshops so that everyone can sort of understand what everyone is saying versus just having you know one group talking at a coffee shop over here another group talking on Facebook here but what happens is and we see this over and over and over when everyone starts talking in one big room and hearing what their fellow residents are saying then that helps really identify the real priorities um, for the destination, the real gaps and challenges that maybe it's not just all about parking, but maybe it's about how a young new mom needs to make sure that there's um, year round um, business with the visitor economy. So looking at seasonal visitor dispersal or, or understanding how um, the transportation is impacting how people get to work, like the really, really big um, mega themes that can be uh, impacting again not just the visitor experience but uh, the local quality of life it's really it's a long-term strategy overall to improve facilities services attractions and some big things that need to be addressed and very very clearly stating that this isn't all up to the DO of course um, but it's definitely up to the DO to communicate this and support other organizations and entities within the destination um, to address some of these uh, long-term needs. And then as we put all of that together, we develop a plan that really includes a number of high-level strategic goals, maybe five to six strategic goals, and then m numerous, half a dozen um, specific actionable initiatives with leads designated to drive those initiatives, targets, timelines, so that by the end of this, a destination has a very actionable strategic plan, a roadmap for the future um, that really is designed to both grow visitor, if not volume, then value and direct spend and uh, average length of stay, all those big drivers, but at the same time ensure that the local community is part of that destination development strategy, benefits from that destination development strategy to create that balance that we we talk about so much and very very much as we're doing this it's along with the board of directors as well they have um, various approval processes through it we keep them up to date um, they're obviously part of the, the steering committee so it's a very transparent process at the same time that's so helpful and I think you know no matter where anyone is at in the process it's just awesome to connect everyone with all three of you as resources to really do that um, self-check. I think we have time for one more question, so I'm going to see if I can unmute. Um, I believe it's Racine from Glacier Mountain. 
Yes, hi. Hi. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm in Montana, and we are a regional destination marketing organization. Uh, we have 75 communities in eight counties within a 22,000 square mile range. We know we need to be proactive. But we, as a destination, really struggle because we have the tiny towns of 300 that don't want tourism to the urban cities and resorts that do and are dealing with all the issues of, a, of a, the urban, uh, more populated uh, destinations in, in the country. We struggle with where to go. We've done the Destination Next program, but how can these next step or the next step in this process work for an organization like ours yeah it's harder when you have so many different constituencies and municipalities and various levels of, of government and at the same time a low population base that's so spread out so having worked with some of these the key thing is to get everyone into a large room and start hearing what everyone has to say and start let the destination organization ask questions and say what if we try this what if we try that um, at least at the beginning of a process or sometime in your strategic planning. Just get everyone in the same room. What the, the, you know, what's interesting, the biggest thing we find from master plan is that the process is just as much sometimes of value as the, the end plan because you're bringing people together and they're talking to each other and they'll continue those conversations on. They're problem solving and they're understanding what everyone's challenges are um, in a live environment. So to have that no matter how, you know, if you can bring people into a central area and have those conversations are paramount and then continue that conversation online. Um, you know, we do regional assessments for entire states where we'll work with all the different organizations um, and see how we can connect them so that everyone's sort of talking about the same issues within the destination. Um, also, you know who does something really interesting is Oregon. They have the rural studios where they will design um, specific strategies for um, smaller spread out rural slash destinations. So this is something that potentially would be good to talk with state tourism to see how they could help um, develop programs in the model of what Todd Davidson is doing in Oregon. Um, but really it's focusing on those unique attributes of each community and hearing those from the community and really thinking about the destination as not just experiences but as and a unique energy, a unique vibe that communi communicated, whatever it is that can connect all of those different communities uh, around the same storyline, and then how all of those different communities can plug into that story in different ways to define what's unique about their um, specific areas, you know, in a hyper hyper local sense. But one, getting everyone into the same room and then continuing that conversation online is the strategy that we've seen effective with other destinations. Great, thank you. I think that's a really great piece of advice, Greg, to end us. And we actually had a few more questions come in that are amazing, I would think would almost constitute a part two of this webinar. So um, for anyone that submitted those, I will share those with our panelists. Mm -hmm. And if, then if they're okay, we'll share the, the responses and the follow-up. But we will be uh, sending out the recording. And please utilize us for any Hi, questions or um, anything else you might need. But I just want to thank Greg, Kathleen, and Paul, and any questions closing comments for us? Yes, just one. Um, if there are more questions, of course, we're very happy to talk about this. I can talk about this stuff all day long. I'm happy to do that. We work <laughs> worldwide. So here are um, our email addresses. Okay. Please feel free to reach out at any time with any um, questions you might have.